During my time in college, I felt that my biggest priority was to involve myself in as many of the music-based clubs we had as possible. So because of that, I became an active part of my college's chapter for the National Association for Music Education, and some friends and I even started up our own theater club in order to give students more opportunities to perform. It was definitely a lot of worthwhile experience to say the least, but the club that I have the most experience with was with my college's male a cappella group, the Crescent Bros. I've done a few a cappella pieces during my time in high school with choir and for the Metropolitan Youth Orchestra, and you know, going into college, my primary instrument was voice, so I was pretty familiar with the style, so I figured, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go audition, I'll give it a go. And they didn't let me in. So I auditioned the next year, and they didn't let me in. Until one guy then decided to uh, leave because he had to go pursue student teaching, and then they decided to pull me in. From that point, I became the music director of the group, and eventually even the president of the club during my senior year of college, and while I was in grad school, I served as an advisor to the group as well. I developed a really deep adoration for acapella music due to how much of an impact this group has had on my life within the span of three and a half years. But we're not here to talk about my college days where all I ate was pizza and I wore pajamas on a very daily basis. We're here to talk about acapella representation in video games. Before the video begins, if you enjoy my content, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so that you can be notified as to whenever I upload a brand new video. I'm trying to get to 500 subscribers by the end of 2020, and we are so close to that goal. If you guys could help out, that would be greatly appreciated. So if anybody doesn't know what acapella is, it's a style of music where a song is performed solely with voice. It has no other instrumentation. It's Italian for in the church style, and is often performed in a polyphonic style, where multiple parts are singing independently at the same time. Now, if you've watched The Office, I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with the style thanks to Andy Bernard, but one of the things that I love about it is that it has its own way of portraying certain emotions without needing instruments like the guitar, keyboard, drums, and everything else that you'd see in a typical rock band these days. It can provide some really interesting colors to an already colorful song. Probably the earliest form of a cappella music comes in the form of Gregorian chants, liturgical music of the Roman Catholic Church. Gregorian chants were songs sung in order to accompany the text of the Mass and were strictly monophonic. When a song is monophonic, the only music that is being played is a single melody. No chordal singing and not even slight variations of the melody in order to harmonize with it. Everybody sings the same melody, which is clearly different from how polyphonic modern a cappella is today. Very similarly to plagal cadences, which I talked about in my cadences video, check it out after this one, Gregorian chants were actually very common in church music or sacred music during the 14th and 15th century, with common songs being different variations of Kyrie eleison and Agnus Dei. Probably one of, if not the most popular example of Gregorian chant in video games is with the iconic opening to the Halo franchise. The song begins with this ominous low droning note while the choir comes in shortly after. Now I know that with that droning note, this might set the Halo theme apart from actual Gregorian chants, but this portion was actually written with the sound of Gregorian chants in mind. As you can hear, there's a group of male singers singing this melodic phrase, which was very typical actually for Gregorian chants, as they were typically sung by men. Women were not allowed to perform in Gregorian chants for quite some time actually. As mentioned by an unknown writer for newliturgicalmovement.org, Pope Pius X, hey, that's the name of the performance hall at my college, declared that singers in church need to have a real liturgical office. Therefore, women being incapable of exercising such office cannot be part of the choir. If a soprano or contralto are needed, these parts must be taken by boys. This actually kind of 
helps lead into a very disgusting point that I want to talk about when it comes to Gregorian chants. Uh, if a higher singer was needed, then some unlucky sap was selected as a child to be castrated. This was a very typical thing that happened, though, because if a child had a very pure and high voice, musicians wanted that child to keep that voice as they got older. So, in order to do that, the child was castrated. It's a very gruesome thing, I'm not going to go too much more into detail on that, but all I can say is, thankfully, these actions are no longer practiced, I hope. But enough about that, because, oh god, I don't want to lose too many viewers just from talking about castration. One of the biggest characteristics of Gregorian chant, actually, is its meter, or lack thereof, if you will. Gregorian chants were much more freeform, and were performed without a sense of meter or time. So at the beginning of the Halo theme, it's actually pretty difficult to develop a sense of time before the percussion comes in to help us maintain a steady beat. With that in mind, I just notated it in 4-4 to the best of my ability. I love how that lack of meter actually adds to the overall ominous feel that this piece has at the beginning. It gives it a much more angelic, yet haunted kind of feel, which is pretty ironic if you think about it. Another very popular form of acapella is actually in the form of barbershop quartets. These are actually still really popular to this day, and I often find myself watching competition performances on YouTube because I just love the harmonies that groups can come up with. Barbershop quartets mainly use four different singers, tenor one, tenor two, the baritone, and the bass. Mentalfloss.com's article on barbershop quartets reads, Barbershop vocals are characterized by the second tenor, the lead, carrying the melody with the first tenor singing harmony above him. The bass provides the foundation, and the baritone fills in the middle spaces. On barbershop.org's history on the barbershop quartet article, Lynn Abbott, a professor at Tulane University discovered overwhelming evidence that barbershop quartetting was pervasive in African-American culture in the late 1800s and early 1900s, including lots of musicians who became the pioneers of jazz. The black community harmonized recreationally the popular songs of the day, improvising harmonies according to African-American musical practice. Barbershop quartet numbers were usually filled to the brim with seventh chords in order to add some spice and flavor to the song. There are some chords that are sung with one note doubled in order to give some chords a bit of a sense of resolution, however. Now, 8-Bit Music Theory has done an incredible job on analyzing Bioshock Infinite's barbershop rendition of God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. So, in order to not go into something that's already been covered, let's take a look at Don't Deal With The Devil and a quick break from Cuphead. This game is already an excellent homage to 1930s cartoons and big band jazz, but Having the opening of the entire game be a barbershop quartet number just really made my heart sore. If we look at Don't Deal With The Devil, we see that it actually follows the typical guidelines for a barbershop quartet, where the tenor two line has the closest thing to a melody, the tenor one part never really strays too far from the lead line in order to harmonize with it, and if you look at the notation, a lot of the intervals between those two parts are no more than thirds and fourths. There are a few fifth intervals throughout, but the majority of the intervals are still pretty close in proximity to each other. Whereas the bass line, for the most part, sings notes that display the root of the chord throughout the piece. Well, Cuphead and his pal mug man, they like to roll the dice. By chance they came upon a devil's game, and gosh, they paid the price. I also love how this song modulates to D major in the last two measures of the piece. The opening pretty much paints the picture of how Cuphead and Mugman got into their situation with the devil, but the entire thing is notated in B-flat major, which is relatively darker key-wise than D major. So when the song modulates, it jumps up four key signatures on the circle of fifths. So there's a clear contrast between the kinds of sounds that they're trying to go for. I also just love how ironic this modulation is. With a line as gruesome as the devil will take their heads, 
It sounds oddly happy and cheerful. It's really weird. And if they proceed but don't succeed, well, the devil will take their heads. The roles of each part are also just a lot more evident in a quick break. However, where the lead part is a lot more noticeable, the bass line has a lot more characteristics of an actual bass. Specifically with things like these ascending three notes going right into the chorus that go from F to G to A to B flat. So what are you waiting for? Bum, 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 bum. Why not take a quick break? The tenor two line also has a much more melodic line, which is seen towards the end of the song, where the word more in Please Come Back For More is sung going down chromatically, as well as the phrase, and maybe later sing with your barbershop. There's a lot more chromaticism going on there in order to help show you that this is the main line. This is the melody of the piece. Bum, 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 and maybe later sing with your barbershop. Why not take a little quick break and come back for more, or then come back for more, or please come back for more. But now that we've talked about Gregorian chants and barbershop quartets, let's talk about modern acapella. Probably the most distinguishable part of modern acapella is how most parts serve as more of an accompaniment with harmonies thrown into it, not just the harmonization of the melody. There are still parts of acapella renditions where multiple parts sing actual words, and I'm definitely someone who's done this a lot too when I was music directing. But with the inclusion of more part variation, this time with even sopranos and altos based on who's in the group, some really interesting chords can be sung in order to give off some beautiful colors to the piece. There's a few really great examples that we can look at, but one that I'm very familiar with is with Super Mario Sunshine and the secret levels. I actually just recently streamed a minimum shine run of this with my buddy Zephram64 on Twitch, so it's still pretty fresh in my mind. But the music that plays whenever you play these levels is an acapella rendition of World 1-1 from the original Super Mario Bros on the NES. It's actually a nice nod to the game's predecessor musically, but also because of how these levels themselves focus on more traditional platforming. A majority of the time, parts will be singing syllables in order to slightly portray the instruments that they're trying to resemble. So for example, lower male parts like the bass will sing words like doom or boom in order to sound more like a bass and add a more percussive feel to that arrangement. <laughs> The vocalists usually sing in these syllables in order to not overpower the main melody line. Although there are some times where this will happen in order to add more power to a particular phrase. Listen to how much more impactful the opening rhythm is with all the singers singing it at the exact same time. Another important point to make is the fact that there's a lot of back and forth motion going on between the high and low parts. There's a ton of different interpretations of this arrangement, but every single one that you find features some kind of back and forth motion between the vocal parts. You never really have one line playing the entire melody. The bass plays a rhythmic accompaniment while the tenor, alto, and soprano lines trade parts of the melody. Each part does a slightly different version of its line in order to create continuity to the piece, but also to add in some extra harmony. This is actually pretty evident towards the middle of the arrangement, where the bass line comes in carrying the melody actually, but then it trades it with the higher vocal parts. And with that, we're gonna call it a video. There's definitely a lot more that I would have talked about, such as, for example, the entire Crash Twin Sanity soundtrack being entirely acapella. But to be honest with you, this script was already getting super long and I didn't wanna risk making this video too long for you guys. 
But if you enjoyed, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and make sure that you ring the bell for new updates on my content. Like I said at the beginning of the video, we are so close to 500 subscribers and I'd like to try and get to that by the end of 2020. So help us out by becoming a member of the community. I also stream four days a week on Twitch and I actually just got to affiliate status. So be sure to come down and hang out. I stream every Monday, Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday at seven o'clock PM. Don't forget to like the video as well and leave a comment down below on a game or a song that you'd like to see a potential future video on. With all that being said, Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.